The most hyped theory in education over the last few decades might be a myth. This video will cover what cognitive load theory is, why I think it's overhyped, its issues, and why I think this matters to more than just the teachers if it is actually a myth. You might not have heard about this theory before, but you've probably heard or used related terms. Mental effort, mental load, brain power, brain capacity, brain limit, brain RAM, or any other related term. The idea that we have a cognitive load limit. Not unique to cognitive load theory, but what you do to help with that limit probably comes from the theory's instructional procedures. Things you can do to help reduce the load. These procedures and effects are used by educators all the way through formal education, online education, to life advice for organising your time, your energy, your effort, your attention, and all other related experiences. But the theory is not only unproven, it can't really be proven right or wrong. John Sweller, alongside many others, started developing the cognitive load theory in the late 1970s. Looking at how students solve problems, they realised that students performed better when there was less to think about. After plenty of experiments, they noticed particular patterns in performance. They suggested these patterns were due to certain effects, then suggested instructional procedures to utilise the effects for better performance, emphasising the effects work when they are considered together, not separate. However, there needed to be some explanation for all of this. By the end of the 1980s, cognitive load referred to demands on working memory, storage, and processing. And that cognitive load was built up of two main types, intrinsic and extraneous load. People or students problem solving would use what was called means-ends analysis, holding the problem, the desired goals, sub-goals, and any other related information in working memory. All of that together resulted in a cognitive load. By removing the goal, so goal-free problems, or removing parts of the problem, so worked out examples, you could reduce the cognitive load. That was referred to as reducing extraneous load. The split attention and modality effects were discussed early on. Mentally integrating lots of information is harder when it's spread out either by distance or time. So by decreasing the information distance, so putting a text explanation next to a diagram would make things easier, lowering the cognitive load. The modality effect is essentially the same thing, except it doesn't have to be the same type of information. So maybe a verbal explanation with a visual image. Sweller and the researchers found that reducing this extraneous load helped with problem solving. The focus up until the 1990s was all about reducing the extraneous load, focusing on the instructional procedures because intrinsic load refers to the inherent nature of the learning task and therefore was assumed to be fixed. However, studies looking at variability found that increased levels of variability resulted in better transfer. But more variability would have meant more cognitive load, more extraneous or bad load. So it shouldn't have helped, but it did. This is where germane load was introduced to the theory, or a good version of cognitive load, as it were. But the need to introduce this new type of load wasn't the only issue with the original theory. Reducing split attention doesn't always work. In fact, a split attention effect only occurs when different sources of information are unintelligible in isolation and therefore need to be mentally integrated. However, some information can be understood in isolation. After more testing, they introduce the redundancy effect and expertise reversal effect. If information says the same thing or is already known by the learner and individual, then it is somewhat redundant and is extraneous load or bad load. But not always. The instructional procedures and design should match the levels of expertise for each individual with variation. And then in the late 2000s, Sweller adopted Geary's ideas around knowledge, biological primary knowledge and biological secondary knowledge into the framework. And it was at this point this framework was started to be shared and used much more widely inside of educational settings. An instructional theory based on knowledge of cognitive architecture. The theory now suggesting we acquire biological primary knowledge and biological secondary knowledge. Biological primary knowledge relating to biological primary skills. Some examples were listening or speaking. The theory being we learn to speak unconsciously 
without explicit instruction, and are internally motivated. Speech therapists were mentioned as a caveat, but as I mentioned in a recent video about reading, everyone has an educator to help them learn to speak, and lots of people need further instruction, the deaf being pretty good examples of that. So speech and learning to speak does need explicit instruction sometimes. Some deaf people don't learn to speak because they learn sign language instead. They are internally motivated to learn a way of communicating, not necessarily speaking. So when Sweller says, we do not need to be motivated by others to acquire these language skills, I disagree. Other people are reasons why we learn to communicate, relying on the environments we are in and the experiences that we have. In addition to this, unconscious learning or implicit learning happens in lots of different learning experiences, including reading. Reading being categorized as a biological secondary skill alongside writing because Biological secondary knowledge is knowledge that has become culturally important and needs to be acquired in order to function appropriately in society. But I would argue speaking and listening is culturally important and required to function in society. Also, reading expertise is far from a yes or no skill. The theory argues biological secondary knowledge is unlikely to be learned without explicit instruction. However, unlikely doesn't mean impossible, and we learn from experiences or empiricism so we can learn no skills without explicit instruction. Effectiveness will of course differ, but it is still possible. The reasons described to separate these skills is ease of acquisition. We may not be motivated to learn to read and write, and so learning reading and writing is likely to require conscious considerable effort over long periods of time. Another quote that I think is useful context here, we do not need educational systems and procedures to teach people to listen and speak. In contrast, without schools, most people will not learn to read and write. However, homeschooling is a thing, and it's much like a parent teaching a child any sort of skill before it goes into formal education. So if the example skills could fit into biological primary skills and biological secondary skills with the categorizations differing depending on the individual's situations and learning experiences, the rules and categorizations aren't always followed because it is most of the time. Meaning the categorization isn't lawful, a term used in science to describe something that happens regardless of the circumstances or the context. My question, why are we separating these skills and or knowledges? This is important because the theory focuses on secondary knowledges and skills. The argument being these skills are acquired differently. We acquire biological primary information in a manner that is very different from the manner in which we acquire biological secondary information. So how do you apply the theory to practicing primary skills if they are acquired so differently. Cognitive load theory claims only validity for the acquisition of biological secondary knowledge because this is where working memory is needed. Yet the instructional procedures suggested by the cognitive load theory works for biological primary skills like speaking. If the theory should only be applied to the secondary skills, but works for the primary skills as well, and the effects are inconsistent, with each person ideally needing various learning experiences, that sounds like a lot of limitations and challenges to be able to put the theory into practice. I'm struggling to understand what the hype is all about. I'm not a teacher, but this theory applies to me as a learner and educator and every organism but it is intended for humans. It states five principles that underpin all of this work. We store information, the information store principle. We obtain information from others, the borrowing and organizing principle. We generate novel information, the randomness as genesis principle. We restrict generating novel information to protect stored information, the narrow limits of change principle. We use stored information to determine how we behave, the environmental organizing and linking principle. Long-term memory is a well-documented theory in cognitive psychology. One idea is that genomes store information, but there is no agreed-upon way to measure the size or density of information in a genome. De Groot's original research from 1965 was translated from Dutch to English 20 years later and now has been republished, and it was all about chess grandmasters, showing that better chess players are better at remembering chess positions, unless the pieces are put in random places. 
This was put down to better players having a big library of board positions stored in long-term memory. Thus, long-term memory must be helpful for performance. All expertise, on this view, is determined by what is stored in the long-term memory. But I'm not sure how that applies to reading, though. Only memorizing sight words is potentially dangerous, as I mentioned in the previous video. Remembering things is obviously important, but what and where it is stored is a question that can't really be answered. We can't take out a long-term memory store and see what's in it or where it even is. It, it's all in theory. Borrowing or acquiring information from others is also improvable. Borrow suggests we can give it back, which obviously we can't. But acquire suggests other people have a store that we gain access to somehow to make a copy of. The theory suggesting we make a copy then reorganize it. But if we have access to their store, an expert store, why don't we just copy it? In the case of chess, that would make life far easier. Sweller references Bandura's social learning theory here. We learn from others, which is also learning from experiences, empiricism. But Bandura's theory is built around observation, not explicit instruction. Again, this challenges the ideas around biological primary and secondary skills, because if it's mainly about observation, then what is so important about instruction? And the theory assumes that learners acquire domain-specific information that is best obtained from other people. All the cognitive load instructional effects depend on these assumptions. But if we acquire information from other people without interacting with them, are we acquiring from their long-term memory store? Or are we developing expertise from our own experience observing them? That would suggest we are generating our own novel information, which in cognitive load theory suggests we rarely do. Sweller mentions these schemas, the stores of information in long-term memory, are different for every person. Because of the reorganization of this copy that we've got from their long-term memory store, somehow. I am going to assume the reorganization process isn't a choice because we can't just copy information from other people and put it into our own brains. It doesn't work like that. I wish it did. But the theory suggests that these schema grow from acquiring information and that constructing knowledge just happens naturally. We have evolved to construct knowledge. It is a biological primary skill. Arguing that theories about discovery learning for knowledge construction is no better than acquired information from explicit instruction. We have neither theoretical reasons nor empirical evidence that withholding information from learners results in better learning. However, Desirable difficulty is exactly that. Experts and novices requiring different levels of problems which are adjusted by withholding information. The worked example effect they even start with is an example of this. Unless I'm missing something, they have done the empirical research and got the data with support that they said no one has done. With this framework being built from natural processes, many of the ideas come from things like evolution. However, there isn't really a distinction between information and knowledge, or what different knowledge is, apart from the biological primary and secondary categorizations. The third principle, the randomness as genesis principle, talks about generating novel information. If the novel information is useful, then it is stored. And that's much like the borrowed and organizing principle. Paul. Dealing with familiar problems in this manner is critical to problem-solving skills, but is unlikely to result in the generation of new knowledge. In contrast, dealing with novel, unfamiliar problems has the potential to create new knowledge. New knowledge can be generated when we discover a new procedure or concept during problem solving. A new procedure or new concept. But it doesn't say how different a problem or procedure needs to be for it to be new. In maths, is that a different number? A negative number? A fraction? A decimal? If you add numbers together, the procedure will be different with each number because each number is different. But is that new or do you need something more? And then as the borrowing information requires reorganization, well, if we're reorganizing it for ourselves, isn't that information new? We need to understand that teaching learners to be flexible and creative requires us to teach them to engage in random generate and test. Flexible and creative at problem solving? Yes. But why separate learning experiences from the borrowing and organizing principle and generating new novel information when you could argue all the information and knowledge is new, or at least unique to that individual? Unique being new.
simply asserting that encouraging learners to engage in generative, constructivistic, creative activities will be beneficial is inappropriate in the absence of data. Now again, proving something is new or novel is impossible because we can't go in and pluck out that information and test it backwards and forwards because we can't do that. It's all in theory. But what we can test is practice related to performance. And the generation effect shows with data that if we generate information, it is more easily remembered than if we are given it. Moving to the narrow limits of change principle, this relies heavily on the work done for working memory and the limits to capacity and duration. Limited to seven items for around 20 seconds or three to four items when processing. Processing refers to combining, contrasting or dealing in some manner with multiple elements. Again, unless I'm missing something here, all we can do to test processing is to measure brain activation levels. I hope our brain is active, especially when we are thinking. But as to the item limits, what, what counts as an item? A number? A year, which is four numbers? A phone number, which is ten plus numbers? Schemas and chunks have been suggested as ways to group information together into an item? How the memory palace and memory techniques have been suggested to work? But this means, although the seven item limit might be accurate, seven watts. That is going to change between each person, especially when we consider expertise and experience. Some items bypassing working memory processing and going straight into long-term memory stores, according to theory. When considering working memory and long-term memory, this is again where lots of different conflicting theories come up. Long-term working memory has been suggested as an intermittent part between long-term and working memory. For those unaware, the theories around short-term memory have been rejected by the majority of cognitive psychologists for the working memory theory. But the working memory theory hasn't been proven and the fifth principle says that working memory uses signals from the environment to determine which aspects of long-term memory are relevant to current processing. Linking and organizing information from the current environment to current thinking. Whether that is in working memory, long-term memory, long-term working memory, or something else, is unknown and unproven. But whatever this thing is, it must be different from what they're using as working memory because there are no known limits to the amount of organized information held in long-term memory that can be cued by appropriate environmental signals. So assuming information is stored, we don't know what, when, or how specific the information stored is. We can't measure specifics about where it comes from, only that it comes from our experiences. And item limits will actually vary on every individual case. And those item limits don't apply to cued information, which could be from prior knowledge or experiences in long-term memory, which obviously is going to change with each individual. That obviously is going to impact the experience of cognitive load, which is what this entire theory is built from. And this is where another term is really important to the theory, which is element interactivity. Again, unless I'm missing something, there's no specifics on what an element is or isn't, just that the more element interactivity, the higher the cognitive load, the lower the interactivity, the lower the load. With the intrinsic load being fixed because of the complexity of the knowledge trying to be acquired, element interactivity there can't be changed, but extraneous load is how knowledge is being acquired, altered by experience, so element interactivity can be altered. Any problem, say a maths problem that has elements, say a number and symbols, has interacting elements, numbers and symbols put together, which is the intrinsic load. That could be high or low, depending on the individual, but the load is fixed. This heavy working memory load is not caused by the need to process many elements, but rather by the need to process many elements simultaneously. However, I don't see any mention of the element interactions requiring any more or less processing. So instead of focusing on the amount of elements interacting, the severity or difficulty or intensity of the interaction just isn't mentioned. But again, as this is all in theory, all we can really measure is brain activation levels and it doesn't give us specifics about what is intense, what isn't intense, or however many things are being interacting because we just can't know. It's all theory. 
But the idea is these interactions is how we could explain understanding. The difference between knowing a correct symbol and knowing how to deal with an equation can be expressed entirely in element interactivity terms. Epistemology is the philosophical study of knowledge and there are different views on what it means to understand something. But taking this view of element interactivity, further understanding consists of more information stored in long-term memory, thus understanding requiring more element interactivity. Three 3 times 4 is 12, but so is 4 add 4 add 4, and 6 times 2, etc, etc. I would personally say depth of understanding instead of level of element interactivity, but essentially, different practice has a different intrinsic cognitive load. Emphasis on practice. Practice is over time, not a, a snapshot. We all practice, and what that practice looks like is what the procedures, the instructional procedures, is all about. Variability in practice was one of the reasons mentioned earlier for Germain Lowe to be introduced to the theory. Rather than just learning how to use an equation, a task that is relatively low in element interactivity, learners also learn which equations were appropriate at which time, a task that requires the processing of many more interactions interacting elements. But the intrinsic load doesn't change, it's fixed. The difference being the grouped intrinsic load of a task or group of tasks over a certain period of time. Practice. A practice session with higher variability having higher intrinsic load in comparison to another practice session. The isolated elements effect is also attributed to intrinsic load, not by task intrinsic load, but by the order in which you do those tasks. The students who were presented with the elements in isolated form first performed better on subsequent test problems, providing an example of the isolated elements effect. So making a task simpler ends in better performance. An observation found years before this theory, extraneous load is under the control of instructors, and so the interacting elements due to extraneous cognitive load can be reduced or eliminated by changing instructional procedures. Goal-free problems, or removing the goal, was one of those earlier effects mentioned. But as most problems don't actually meet the requirements for this effect to be effective, they suggest a different effect. It is demonstrated when students learn more by studying a problem and its solution rather than solving the problem themselves. That's the worked examples effect. However, from what I've read and understood about the literature, it's not about students learning more or better, rather quicker. Emphasizing a point Swella says here, none of the effects should be considered in isolation from the theoretical constructs that gave rise to them, combining worked examples with the principles of practice. To me, this worked example effect could be explained by experience of effective problem solving, the borrowing and organizing and generating new information principles, or just learning from experience, empiricism. And worked examples also serves as a form of corrective feedback, which when solving a problem alone, you don't necessarily get access to. So seeing solutions and getting feedback ends in better performance. Another observation found years before this theory, like demonstration. The other mentioned effects also relate to theories and observations seen well before this theory, but it's the underpinning of this theory that is supposedly so different, the element interactivity, which is cognitive load. That is what the mental effort, mental load, brain capacity, brain span terms refer to, is. But how do you measure it? If we can't measure it, then there's no real way to apply those reducing procedures in practice effectively because it's going to be a lot of guesswork. And well, we can't measure it. This graph is the best I've found, which tries to estimate different cognitive loads. You've got the peak, you've got average, you've got total over a time limit, and the different types of cognitive load. But this doesn't consider residual load, so the load before the task started, because we don't suddenly just start something, there is an experience before that. And more importantly, this is all based off of subjective questionnaires. Likert scales of 1 to 9, how hard was that? 1 to 9, was that a difficult task? Some have looked at different substitutes looking for efficiency, higher perceived mental effort and lower performance resulting in lower efficiency, and lower perceived mental effort but high performance resulting in higher efficiency. But the effort is still subjective and the performance is still going to be specific about the metrics measured for performance 
performance, which is what we naturally do when we're learning through practice anyway. So these instructional procedures from cognitive low theory built on cognitive architecture only work in very specific cases and can't be proven true or false. If a myth is misrepresentation of the truth or widely held false beliefs or ideas, then I think the cognitive load theory is full of myths. With clear and well-stated objectives, learners can use natural learning processes to develop skills. Creating clear and well-stated objectives is a skill I think people should develop inside of education. But if people have a set goal, manage their resources, have access to feedback and support, while doing related tasks, i.e. practice, they will develop the skills. Yes, explicit instruction helps, but when there isn't available, like after school, how do people then learn? If they've always learned by following explicit instructions step by step or by using worked out examples, how are they going to be able to solve complex problems? Their learning abilities in other situations, like adult life when they graduate school, is going to be less effective because they haven't learned to develop skills in those environments. When doing the wrong thing better, it makes it worse. Being better at following instructions or completing a half-finished problem can make you worse at completing or solving complex problems that you have to start from the beginning. For me, this means practice design is more important than instructional procedures, but I take an ecological approach to learning science, and if that's something that interests you, maybe take a look at this video, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about cognitive load theory in the comment section below.